but we'll definitely catch up time. We will be starting off with a presentation by Mr. Stan Henkman from the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. There are a few changes to the program, which I will repeat as we go throughout the day. But immediately after Mr. Henkman does his presentation, we will be moving into session four, actually, which will be on Credits Bank Legal Liability. And Professor Bonita Myerspelt will be speaking on that. Following that, Advocate Hermian Cronier will be speaking on failed investigations and continuities. And then after that session, will Mr. Andrew Feinstein from Corruption Watch speak. But I will just re-announce that as time goes by. So I'd like to call Mr. Stan Hinkman without any further delay from the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, IJR. Good morning. Apologies for that, let's try again. Um, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation is indeed grateful for this opportunity to um, share some of our thoughts. And while it's basically uh, focusing on the softer side of corruption, I think it's equally important that we also look at um, the influence that corruption has on reconciliation or the lack of it. So the um, submission is entitled Corruption as an Obstacle to Reconciliation through its impact on inequality and the erosion of trust in institutions and, pub and people. Good morning to the adjudicators, colleagues, and all present here today. Thank you for the opportunity that has been given to the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation to contribute towards the investigation in this manner. The IJR was launched in the year 2000 in the wake of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The aim was to ensure that lessons learned from South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy were taken into account as the nation moved ahead. Today, the Institute helps to build fair, inclusive, and democratic societies in Africa through carefully selected engagements and interventions. For our contribution, I draw on research from my colleagues in our research and policy team, in particular from, two of our, from our two survey projects hosted at IJR, namely the Afrobarometer and the South African Reconciliation Barometer, or SAB as it will be named later, as well as the experiences and insights from our sustained dialogues team who do work in communities with an emphasis on youth, gender justice, and building inclusive societies. Although the relationship between corruption and reconciliation remains largely unexplored, IGR's contribution will explore the current state of reconciliation followed by factors hampering progress in this regard with emphasis on inequality and trust in institutions and people. These findings will then be tied to corruption through these two factors. Let's look at the state of reconciliation. Evidence from Saab, South African Reconciliation Barometer, suggests that South Africans across all groups are willing to engage in and support further reconciliation efforts. In 2017, over 75% of South Africans believe 
unity is a desirable objective. And 68% believe unity is possible. Since Saab's inception in 2003, most South Africans have indicated their preference for a united South Africa. In addition, in 2017, more than seven in every 10 South Africans believe the country still needs reconciliation. Only 56% of South Africans, however, believe that South Africa has made progress in reconciliation, while less than half of South Africans reported having, ex having experienced reconciliation in 2017. What explains the disparity between South Africans desiring reconciliation, yet not experiencing it? What factors inhibit the goal of reconciliation? As South Africa's post-reconciliation effort extends into its second decade, there are several obstacles to the goal of reconciliation. The first one is inequality and reconciliation. When South Africans are asked to identify the primary sources of division in society, inequality is consistently, in, in, um, excuse me, inequality is, I've lost my place. <laughs> it happens, oh, there we go. Shall we try again? Um, when South Africans are asked to identify the primary source of division in South Africa, inequality is consistently perceived as the main source of division. In addition, only 23% of South Africans believe levels of, in, of inequality have improved since 1994, while 46% of South Africans believe inequality has worsened since 1994. Inequality is furthermore the aspect of society that the least amount of South Africans perceive to have improved. What does this mean in terms of reconciliation? In its conceptualization of reconciliation, Saab posits that unjust or unequal power relations between different social groups hinders progress towards reconciliation. More just and equitable power relations would create a more fertile environment for reconciliation. In addition, our research with the South African Labor and Development Research Union, also known as SALDRU, at UCT, shows that high levels of inequality and the perception that inequality has not improved in the post-apartheid period are the key impediments to social cohesion in South Africa. Considering the history of South Africa and the strict hierarchical structures enforced under apartheid and colonialism, the fact that inequality between South Africans serve as a form of division and is experienced as such is perhaps not surprising. However, two decades since the beginning of the democratic and constitutional era, what explains the continued presence of inequality as a divisive force in society. One possible explanation for the persistence of inequality in South Africa is the persistence of corruption. Let's look at the relationship between corruption and inequality. Detailed research reveals that corruption, whether at the level of state institutions, in the private sector, or at local service, provision reinforces inequality. Moreover, the relationship between corruption and inequality is cyclical. When people engage in corruption, it is to the illegal benefit of a few individuals at the expense of others. Corruption, therefore, perpetuates inequality. The primary obstacle to reconciliation in South Africa, may I remind you. The effects of corruption on inequality are both direct and indirect. In a direct sense, citizens are sometimes forced to provide bribes for basic services. 
such as receiving documentation or eliciting help from police or health services. Here, inequality is perpetuated as citizens in better served communities are less likely to be forced to submit them themselves to bribery or corrupt practices. In an indirect sense, widespread corruption in both the public and private sector has a demonstrably negative effect on economic growth, income, inequality, and poverty. <coughs> corruption inhibits the effective functioning of government and business, the central components in the national eco economy. Studies have shown that a worsening in the corruption index, index of a country increases the Gini coefficient, which is the standard measure of inequality in societies. While there is some debate around the direction of the relationship between corruption and inequality as to whether inequality causes corruption or corruption causes inequality, there is major consensus on the interrelated relationship between the two. In other words, a decreasing level of corruption is likely to, to result in a decreasing level of inequality. Given the relationship between corruption and the eradication of inequality, perhaps it is time for all of us to combat inequality as a barrier to reconciliation by combating corruption. Let's look at gender and corruption. Inasmuch as corruption plays a role in maintaining economic inequalities, it also carries a particular gender discrimination. While all citizens are affected by corruption, women and other marginal gender identities bear the brunt of corrupt practices. In short, women are in many settings more exposed to corruption and its consequences. The United Nations Development Program, or the UNDP, and other international organizations identify four broad areas in which women are subject to corruption. Number one, they are subject to corruption when accessing basic services, markets, and credit. Secondly, when they engage in politics. Thirdly, they are subject to corruption in situations where women's rights are violated, example, through trafficking and sexual extortion. And fourthly, women are subject to, to corruption through the negligence or through neg negligence and mismanagement. Women and other gender marginalized persons are more deaf dependent on public services, such as reproductive health and social grant provision. Corruption, through its insidious effect on service delivery, makes a cruel situation more horrible. Women and LGBTQIA plus people often face corrupt officials demanding bribes, which carries the risk of physical or sexual extortion. Patriarchal systems and societies make women and other marginalized gender identities vulnerable to corruption. Increasing or consistent levels of corruption increase or maintains, maintains le maintain levels of inequality. More systematically, corruption is harmful to both economic growth and in income inequality which have long-term implications for the future of inequality as a source of division and thus reconciliation in South Africa. This affects all South Africans, but in particular, women and other gender marginalized persons. We now come to corruption and trust in institutions. Inequality is not the only link we find between corruption and reconciliation. Reconciliation is more likely to thrive in a society where there is a growing democratic political culture. This is evident when citizens feel, citizens feel part of an inclusive nation. 
participate in the political processes, feel the government is legitimately elected, and respect the rule of law. Citizens' perceptions of corruption is closely related to their trust in institutions. Again, the relationship is cyclical. Citizens' experience of corruption lowers their trust in institutions, which is likely to increase the perception of corruption. Afrobarometer studies indicate, and I quote, the perceived level of corruption has a strong adverse effect on citizens, close quote, and also their trust in political institutions. In short, high levels of corruption cause citizens to lose trust in the state, service providers, and institutions. The most recent data from round six of Afrobarometer in 2015 illustrates waning confidence in institutional integrity. When asked whether the level of corruption in this country increased, decreased, or stayed the same, 64% of respondents claim corruption had increased a lot in the last year, with a further 20% stating corruption increased somewhat. So in all, 84% of people indicated that corruption has increased in some way. Respondents were equally unhappy with the response in corruption, to corruption, with 50% <coughs> saying the government was dealing with corruption very badly, and a further 23% saying the that the response <coughs> from government was fairly bad. Aside from its relationship with inequality, Corruption represents an obstacle to reconciliation as it minimizes trust in institutions and other people. Longer term evidence from Afrobarometer demonstrates this relationship between institutional trust and corruption. The examples or the example of citizens' trust in police, police, an institution we all rely on for our security, is instructive. Asked whether the police are involved in corruption in round two in the round two survey of 2002 38% of respondents <coughs> said most of all or sorry most or all police officers were corrupt in round 6 2015 this figure had increased to 48% as a parallel in round 2 21% of respondents claim they did not trust the police at all. And in round six, 2015, this figure increased to 27%. In short, between 2002 and 2015, South Africans' perception of police corruption and distrust in the police had increased 10% and 6% respectively. Trust in the South African state has also diminished. Irregular expenditure by government departments has increased the perception of widespread corruption within the state on the national level. This perception has been exacerbated by mismanagement of state-owned enterprises, which have become a hotbed for cronyism and corruption. In the private sector, multinational corporations, fraudulent business practices, have cost the public invest, investment corporation billions. And here I'm referring to, to the, the money lost by the public um, investment corporations through the Steinoff investments. Corruption thus is not only a phenomenon at the state institution level, but also in, in the private sector. And it may even manifest in the relationship between various institutions and, and sectors. To move on to an ongoing institutional crisis, as an organization based in Cape Town, it would be remiss not to mention the city's water crisis in relation to corruption and mismanagement. We know that water, that water crises are really a matter of rainfall only. Cape Town is preparing to become the first major city to run out of water because 
our institutions have failed their constituents. The National Department of Water and Sanitation has been reluctant to release emergency funding and as a result of, as a result of their own management, mismanagement of funds. Meanwhile, the local government has been embroiled in party politicking, infighting, and corruption scandals for several months. This failure of leadership will soon have disastrous effects on basic service provisions, provision for everyone in South Africa's second largest city. And it is likely to, mad, to damage what little trust remains between citizens and institutions. Corruption does not only have an impact on the national, provincial, or even local governance level, but also on individual and community levels. One of our senior facilitators encountered the following situation, which, ca which captures the impact of everyday corruption on the lives of South Africans. In Otswan, a small town in the Klein Karoo, an experienced community leader and volunteer in helping abused women, and let's just call her Clara, um, for many years she was a participant in one of our projects. She couldn't receive, oh, sorry, she couldn't re-establish a shelter for abused women. The Department of Social Development allegedly refused to give funding for the new Board of Trustees as the previous board had misused funds and failed to meet auditing requirements. For years, the department refused to help Clara, a pensioner, and she had to fund the shelter from her own pocket so that she could not disappoint dozens of women who sought her help and support for a safe space after traumatic experiences of abuse. The financial burden of supporting the South shelter took a toll on her own family, but she continued to provide this essential service without state intervention. Concluding remarks. We have explored the relationship between inequality and reconciliation, corruption and, and, and corruption and inequality, and corruption and institutional trust. We have seen how corruption and mismanagement at a local and national level has affected access to basic services. We are only too well aware of the effects that state capture and private sector negligence have on public resources. I'd like to end with a plea. We need to reckon with our economic as well as our political history. Relationship of inequality and corruption are part of the very fabric of this country's history. Despite the progression from a party to democracy, the dynamics of inequality, especially with regards to access to services, remain largely unchanged. We should not be so blind as to think that if only one or two people were removed from their positions, corruption will become a thing of the past. We cannot pretend that corruption is a recent phenomenon, peculiar to the current national administration. Corruption is a pervasive system of relations built on inequality, a system that manifests in the public and private sectors, in local and national government, in courtrooms and offices. We must reassert the moral and ethical duty of public and professional services. That is how we restore democratic norms and allow them to take root. That is how we allow the ethos of anti-corruption to be built into the fabric of our society. We need a cultural norm and a sense of integrity. We need a cultural norm and a sense of integrity to be renewed, and this whole notion of doing right should be part of our approach to justice. If we are to create a just, equi equitable, and reconciled South Africa, we need to rid ourselves of the culture of corruption. Corruption should be seen as a major obstacle to reconciliation and the goal of an equal society. To further South, Africans, South Africa's reconciliation agenda, Corruption needs to be stamped out at national and local level in the public and private sector. Moreover, the implementation of measures to curb and reduce corruption 
should reduce income inequality and divisions of Africa. By reducing corruption, citizens are more likely to trust in government, public representatives and business. Interpersonal trust, in trust in, and trust in one's public service is an essential basis for reconciliation. Similarly, by combating corruption to reduce entrenched equality, it is possible to, to minimize divisions and create the basis of a just society in South Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the panel. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Henkerman. Um, I just uh, wanted uh, you to maybe uh, give us some concrete uh, examples, uh, South African concrete examples, on the relationship between inequality and, and corruption in the same way as you may be used in talking about uh, the lack of uh, trust in institutions when you refer to the police. I just thought maybe in your work uh, this uh, relationship between uh, inequality and corruption was uh, probed or you've done some work in relation to that. So, so um, some of the examples uh, I, I quote here, come from our South African Reconciliation Barometer, this is on, um, and the Afro Barometer. And so I, I have brought with me a, a hard copy of the latest South African Reconciliation Barometer, which, um, which is a public perception survey uh, done across South Africa, a different strata of the South African society. Um, and so it gives us a good indication of, of how people feel about these things. And so, um, to come back to your question about concrete examples, um, I think the, the, uh, if, if you disaggregate the money that is lost in corruption, through corruption, um, and you begin to, to see what that money, in fact, the program also alludes to that, you, you, and you look at what could have been done with that money, um, and, 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 and how many people could be uplifted in some way or another, then it is very clear that corrupt practices um, that cost the state or the public purse a lot of money to be lost um, does contribute to inequality. And inequality, um, I think, is, 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 is being um, fueled, and, 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 uh, and fuel is perhaps a strong word, but the, uh, where there is rampant corruption, it simply means that money is being held back from ordinary citizens for basic services and, and, and things that can uplift them. And so, you know, uh, and we're talking both public sector, mainly public sector, because that's, that's public money. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the figures in, in this program, I mean, is, 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 is frightening. Um, because, you know, the program talks about how many uh, um, uh, teachers could have been employed and, and, and um, you know, if you look at the state of our education, um, the massive classes that, that, that uh, teachers have to contend with, the low levels of, of, of qualifications in many of our schools, an improvement in the quality of our teachers um, would improve education and it would, in the long run, uh, ensure that fewer of our learners uh, uh, drop out of school. And so that's just one example of how over a period of time, inequality could have been reduced. Um, the, the, the outcomes we get in education um, is, is not only because, because we, we need more money into education, there are other reasons too. But there's an example of how if you b boost the quality of education through stronger uh, um, input from, from, from the fiscus, uh, you know, you could give young people better life chances. And that, that means their lives will be improved and it will take them out of poverty eventually. Um, uh, similarly, um, you know, if you look at, at the, the 
um, the fact that we have a, something like 17 million people uh, dependent on, 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 on social grants. Um, if, if more money could be made available to, uh, to, to uplift people, um, the chances are jobs could, more jobs could be created and fewer people would be reliant on, 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 on social grants. And so for us, there is, there is, there is a very clear um, parallel, or clear link between um, corruption and inequality. Uh, to, to, to come to the second point you make about um, um, I had it in my mind a second ago. Yeah, I, I've made one, one, one point, but I mean, maybe let me just say push it a, a little bit. I mean, if, if you take uh, uh, some of uh, the uh, challenges that uh, face uh, people um, in terms of uh, uh, access to uh, energy resources, electricity, um, and the fact that uh, uh, there are electricity prices are rising um, and, and jobs are being lost because companies cannot continue to operate. Uh, so I just wanted to know whether, you know, in your questions and your surveys, do you ask issues about what's happening with ESCOM? Do you ask what's happening with PRASA and these uh, entities and, and, and to be able to indicate what's the relationship uh, of that to uh, opportunities that people have? So that, that's where yeah. I was going. Now, the, the survey doesn't ask specific questions on, on current events, but what it does show us is that people's responses is linked are linked to what's happening at the moment. Um, you know, uh, uh, trust it was the other issue you raised. It is fascinating if you, if you, so this survey has been going since 2003. So you can actually make the comparison. And, and, and uh, to give you an example, in 2013, trust in the police dropped significantly in the survey. But, you know, if you, if you ask why that big drop, then you can point to Marikana. And so it is, it is, it is uh, um, very interesting how people might not pinpoint specific events, but they do, they do uh, uh, respond to, to what's going on around them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ankerman. You said that we need to reckon with um, both the economic history and political history, and we seem to have uh, made some attempt, attempt to transform the political. Uh, now, did your survey give some indication of how people expect economic transformation so that they would be more empowered, have access, uh, as you said, at the corruption um, obstructs them from. Uh, but if they had, um, if, if this was completely changed from the apartheid era days where the economy was controlled by a few, so did your survey give, feed in some input from the people on how they saw this process uh, to be undertaken? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that question. The, the survey again, um, doesn't ask people, um, you know, questions like, what do you think should be done? Because, because then it becomes very difficult to, to put all that information together. What it does ask people is to give a sense of whether they feel that they are, um, their lives have improved economically, um, to compare their present situation with the previous year, um, and, 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 um, and, and, their prognosis as to, given where they are and how they see things, whether they think their lives will improve economically. So those are the kind of questions we ask. Uh, but what we do do is we use our, our the barometer findings uh, when we engage with, with, with communities <coughs> and, public and, and groups of people. And it is very clear that, um, uh, that there's a sense uh, from, from people in our, in, our, in our workshops, in interventions and dialogues, that because of the corrupt nature of some of, of, 
of public of our public servants and the way uh, services get accessed, um, uh, particularly uh, and and, and um, departments that are singled out here are home affairs, the police, um, and and to a lesser extent the Department of Health, um, and and. And so the sense that, that, that we get from, from our interactions with people is that not only does it hold them back because, um, uh, um, you know, because they have to pay and, and, and they don't have money so they can't access, and it also creates a sense that, that there's nothing they can do. Um, they are these powerful people um, that, 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 that that control the purse strings, that control their destinies. Um, and of course, people always say that we need jobs, we need jobs. Um, but you can imagine to say I need a job is one thing, but to actually know which job I, I, I'm looking for is quite another when you are um, uh, underprepared for the job market um, and even unprepared. And so, uh, the, the, the general sense that, that we get from our uh, <coughs> participants is that you know, the jobs are being kept in the public sector for cronies and people who know people. Um, and, and, and if you don't know any powerful person, the ch your chances of getting a job is, is limited. And unfortunately, a lot of people look to the public sector for jobs because the private sector has become just so competitive. Um, so, so while the survey doesn't ask that directly, our sense from our interactions with people is that, that you know, there isn't, especially amongst um, unemployed people uh, who are undereducated, uh, there isn't a sense that, that, you know, I should have been there, it's just a matter, I need a job and I want a job. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was still formulating my question in my mind. Um, so we understand that the current um, inequalities that we see now are as a result of a system that was put in place to create and sustain those inequalities. Whether you say that was apartheid or colonialism, we have seen over centuries systems being put in place to ensure that certain parts of the communities in South Africa are excluded from benefiting from the economy of the country. Now, I see how corruption sort of adds and continues that legacy. And my question would be, how does IJR see that being curbed? One. Two, what other mechanisms do you think can be used to kind of level um, the playing ground to say so if the people that were very poor and marginalized under apartheid are still the very same people that are marginalized and and disadvantaged by corruption then the the, the, impli the implications and, and and the impacts of corruption themselves are sort of doubled and have a more crippling impact on some um, people and some population of the country than it does to others. So how do you see your work contributing to solving that problem? How do we begin to think and talk about reconciliation in a way, in a way that levels the playing field to an extent? So deal with corruption, yes, current corruption and we know that corruption is not a new phenomenon. We know that apartheid and colonialism themselves were corrupt systems in place, and I agree there are corrupt elements with this system as well. But how do we then deal with the impacts of the past systems, but as well try to deal with corruption and curb that today? Mm. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, so... so, so at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, we have a slogan that we use and that we, we believe in and work on, and it is that if you want to deal with, with the deep systemic problems, you have to go mile deep and inch wide. And as, 
uh, civil society organizations, because we're cash trapped, because we also look always looking for funding, the temptation is always to go mile wide and inch deep. And we made a deliberate decision to go deep. And so, uh, when you, so corruption um, and, and inequality, these are symptomatic, because <coughs> those are the things you see. And the question we need to ask is, what feeds that? And what feeds those things are systems, whether they're private or public, but the system feeds that. And so, if you think about it, the economic system of this country has not changed. And so you cannot expect to see a different outcome if your system is still the same. And so it, is, it has been almost a seamless transition from apartheid to a democratic South Africa, um, but that transition was largely a political transition. And so, um, you know, and, and we have to acknowledge that, you know, we were swept away by the euphoria of 1994 and, you know, that we could vote and all of that, but it soon became very clear that, that economically, you know, things have not shifted. So, so, so the systems needs to be challenged. But you know systems by themselves are large, they are, they are powerful things. And our argument is that you have to ask yourself, what is it that, that feeds the system? Because, you know, we try and cut it off at the systemic level. But people are invested in systems. And especially people who benefit from the systems will find ways of, you know, and you look at, you ask, how do we le level the playing field? You, you know, if we think we're going to level the playing fields by having new people in the same positions, you know, it's not going to happen. And with all due respect to, to the new uh, president of the ANC, you know, I, you know there's a sense of, of excitement, but actually, he, you know, it doesn't matter how good he is, doesn't matter what wonderful ideas he has, but as long as he plays within that same system, you, you're likely to have the same outcomes. And so, so we talk about, you know, the systemic part, but what we need to do is to go right down and ask, what is the culture that feeds that? It's a culture of greed. It's a culture that says some people are better than other people. It's a culture that says, um, you know, some people deserve better than other people. Um, and, and, and that culture needs to be, to be uh, uh, tackled. Because if you, can, if you can cut it off there, then what feeds the system is something different. Um, and and, and so it goes both ways, let me say, in closing. It goes both, it goes both ways. Because you need to, to interrupt and disrupt the thinking of the economists, but at the same time, we also have to disrupt the thinking of ordinary people like us. Because we give them, you know, we give them uh, the field to play on. By, by, and let's all admit that we play into the system as well. I remember in the 80s, in the 80s, even though we didn't have political power, even though we didn't control the economy, I remember how powerful those consumer boycotts were. And it, it, it got them to, it got the companies to take note, and, and I believe that citizens need to take their power back and disrupt and, uh, you know, the system below its knees that it can't walk anymore. Uh, thank you very much. The, the argument you present is an intrinsically strong one. But it could be stronger if there was a link added to the chain. Um, and the link I would suggest to you is one which says, in the first place, the conception of an equal society and how it is to be achieved, the conception of reconciliation and how it is achieved, 
that would perhaps set the platform for the argument in relation to how corruption affects the process. The, of course you imply your conception of equality and your conception of, of reconciliation when you talk about the consequences of corruption. But I thought I would get your comment on the suggestion <clears throat> that if you upfront put up your conception of reconciliation and how it is to be achieved, your conception of equality and how it is achieved, then one could look at corruption and the argument might have been a little stronger. I wonder what your comment is on that. I think, I think you make a very good point, um, um, Justice. Um, and, 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 and yes, I, I think it would have, would, have, would have helped the argument if we, if we came out stronger around the, you know, the, the basic equality of all people and, and so on. Um, so, so I take the point completely. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, because it's true, if, if, if one can agree on a premise, the premise might be that, that all people are equal. Um, and, and, and then, you know, once you have that agreement, you can then almost show how ridiculous corruption, how ridiculous inequality is. How can you have a society where we all believe we're equal in worth, and so we should have equal access to everything, and yet you have this inequality. So I take the point completely that it could have strengthened the argument. And then I ask this because I think you know the argument doing the rounds that white monopoly capital is the cause of the inequality, that people are complaining now because the benefits of, of what is called corruption, the argument says, goes to largely black people. That is the reason for the complaint, for the corruption complaint. And really, the so-called corruption that's going on today, because it benefits black people, is affirmative action and gives rise to greater equality. Now, you've been able to avoid that argument, if you disagree with it, by the way. I must ask you that if you had your definition of equality and affirmative action up front out there. But do you agree with that argument that because the corruption benefits black people, it really is affirmative action? Because in the past, these things benefited white people only. Um, so, so, if you ask me whether, whether, we, whether we believe that affirmative action is necessary, uh, we would say yes. But the argument that says um, corruption benefiting black people is affirmative action, um, I would immediately say I do not agree with that. Because, um, you see, again, we must not, we must not uh, um, make this a, a, an, an issue of, of um, saying, but look at all the people who are, who are being corrupt, they're black people. Because, actually, I just need to say Steinhoff um, and as, as one example of how corrupt, corruption doesn't know color. If you corrupt, you corrupt. And so I have a serious problem if people say, oh, but this is now affirmative action. Affirmative action <clears throat> at whose expense? You see, it's not even at white people's expense. It's at the expense of the poor and marginalized, and they are black people. And so that's, that's, that argument doesn't wash for, for me at all. And one final question. <clears throat> Would you agree that corruption, every attempt at corruption uh, and every successful act of corruption is either uh, is an attempt or successful uh, conclusion of an economic crime? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the sooner, the sooner we, we, we bring people to book, the better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>